we are going to go on a tour. Something like that. Yes. To the Mormon Batillion Historic Site. Mm -hmm. This is down here in Old Town. Oops. Let's uh, go see what this place is all about. Pair over there and a chiropractor. I could use a chiropractor. Look at that car. before. Let me get a close up. There you go. That's where we're going today. chapter in the history of the West. It is a story of people, men and women, who were willing to sacrifice for what they believed. Their story has an unusual beginning. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, nicknamed Mormons, experienced almost constant persecution. Time and again, they were driven from their homes, deprived of their rights and property. Among them were Ezra and Sarah Allen. The Latter-day Saints, including the Allen family, found temporary refuge in the state of Illinois. Within a few years, Nauvoo, their city on the banks of the Mississippi, rivaled Chicago in size. It seemed a haven from all the troubles of the past. It was in Nauvoo that another couple, William Corey and Melissa Burden, met and fell in love. William proposed marriage and Melissa accepted. But the peace and happiness of Nauvoo was short-lived. In 1844, Joseph Smith, the leader of the church, was killed by a mob. Homes and property <laughs> outside the city were destroyed. And finally, in order to avoid further conflict, Brigham Young agreed that the Latter-day Saints would leave the state. Early in February 1846, the exodus of an entire city began. Ezra and Sarah, and William and Melissa put their lives and happiness on hold, and once again left behind almost all that they possessed, starting out across the river toward an unknown destination. By spring, almost 20,000 members of the church were scattered across the Iowa prairie. William and Melissa were married. Four days later, their happiness was interrupted when five men in uniform rode into camp. The officer in charge, Captain Allen, announced that he had orders to enlist 500 Mormons in the war with Mexico. The enlistments came in response to a request by the leaders of the church 
for a way to help finance the immigration west. Still, it came as a shock to the families who first heard about it there on the prairie. It was quite a hard pill to swallow, to leave wives and children destitute and almost helpless, and go fight the battles of a government that had allowed some of its citizens to drive us from our homes. President Brigham Young said, the salvation of the church depended upon raising the army. When I heard this, my mind changed. I felt it was my duty to go. 496 volunteers mustered in, among them Ezra Allen and William Corey. The battalion was about to begin the longest infantry march in U.S. military history. It was not an easy thing saying goodbye to their families there on the prairie, wondering if they would ever see them again. The idea of being separated from her new husband didn't set well with 18-year-old Melissa. I don't see why women must always stay behind and worry about their husbands when they could just as well march beside them. Melissa signed up as a laundress. July 20th, the battalion marched away. They took little food except some flour and whatever they could carry. A blanket, a few clothes, a tin cup. July 24th, marched five miles. The weather, excessively hot. July 25th, no flour. Many went to bed fasting. March 20 miles in camp. My feet are very sore. Melissa and the other women who volunteered as laundresses willingly shared the rigors of the journey. August 1st, the battalion reported for duty at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Each man received a musket and a few supplies, as well as a yearly clothing allowance of $42. Most sent the money back to help their families rather than buy uniforms. The only standard article all soldiers had was a white belt and instructions to keep it clean. From Fort Leavenworth, the battalion took its march to Santa Fe, and Brigham Young's promise was fulfilled. Though there will be battles fought in your front and in your rear, on your right and on your left, you will not have any fighting to do. <laughs> Still, the battalion would endure many hardships. Saturday, August 15th. Our march was slow, the heat intense, the suffering of the sick intolerable. If anything was ailing any of the men, cold or blistered feet or anything else, the doctor would give a dose of calomel and arsenic. All were treated alike. By the time the battalion reached Santa Fe, over 150 were sick and had to be sent to Pueblo, Colorado to recover. September 26th, 23 miles. No rest. March is the daily task. Sick or well, sleep on the rough cold ground with only one blanket to shelter from the cold. Some of the men recorded bits of poetry in their journals. How hard to starve and wear us out on this sandy desert route. We sometimes <coughs> now, for lack of bread, are less than quarter rations fed. At Santa Fe, the battalion was ordered to forge a wagon road to the Pacific Ocean. This morning, all awoke in a storm. Sunk nearly everything we had. As they struggled through New Mexico and Arizona, the terrain became increasingly difficult. The journey must have been especially difficult for Melissa, who was pregnant. Still, she went on with unfailing courage. I didn't mind it. I walked because I wanted to. My husband had to walk, and I went along with him. 
The war with Mexico was at an end by the time the battalion reached San Diego in January 1847. In their ragged state, they looked more like survivors than soldiers. In March of 1847, San Diego was just a village, a plaza surrounded by a church, a few stores and houses. Company B was assigned to peacetime garrison there. While they waited discharge, the company set to work assisting the villagers of San Diego. Carpenters finished houses, fences and buildings were whitewashed. A courthouse was constructed, the first brick building in the town. Perhaps most helpful were the 20 wells they dug and lined with bricks making fresh water readily available. July 4th, 1847, the battalion raised the American flag over Los Angeles. Gentlemen, you are discharged! One year after bidding goodbye to their families, the Mormon battalion was discharged. They didn't know where Brigham Young and the rest of the church were, but they were on their way to find them. A year earlier, in July of 1846, Latter-day Saints, under the leadership of Sam Brannan, had arrived in California on the ship Brooklyn. They became the first colonists in California under American <coughs> rule. The old Californians were amazed at what they had brought with them. Dry goods, tools, vegetable seeds, school supplies, and a library of 179 books. They had also brought a printing press and a supply of newsprint. Everything needed to begin a newspaper. Following their discharge, many members of the battalion headed directly east to rejoin their families. But with speculation that Brigham Young and the rest of the church might continue on to California, some headed north. Among them, Ezra Allen and William and Melissa Corey. I thought it best to make my way fast as possible to San Francisco. But my wife being in a delicate situation, I concluded to stop for a season in Monterey. October 2nd, 1847. My wife was delivered of a fine baby boy. I named him William after myself. I have the greatest boy you ever saw. They planned to move to San Francisco as soon as she was well. But before they could leave, tragedy struck. Baby William died. They had only their faith to sustain them as they prepared to join their comrades in San Francisco. San Francisco is a beautiful place, a fine ship harbor. Things are improving rapidly. Under Brannon's leadership, the Latter-day Saints had started San Francisco's first school, its first bank, and first post office. The printing press had been put to good use. The first edition of the California Star reached the streets of San Francisco January 7, 1847. It was the city's first newspaper. Meanwhile, about 80 members of the discharged battalion had stopped at Sutter's Fort and accepted temporary work in order to purchase needed supplies. Captain John A. Sutter, being desirous of building a flouring mill some six miles from the fort and a sawmill about 45 miles away, proposed to hire all the men. Sutter had wanted to build the mills for some time, but lacked skilled labor to do it. The battalion members, many experienced craftsmen from the east, provided the solution. They worked on a variety of projects. Six were hired to build a sawmill in the mountains. We arrived on the 29th of September. The surrounding country looked wild and lonesome, infested with wolves and grizzly bears. Things progressed well until December. Then winter rains brought high, swift water, which slowed the work. In their downtime, the men built a log cabin so they could move out of the one they had been sharing with the Wimmer family. They moved in on January 23rd. 
The next morning, as they were digging the tailways deeper, the first gold flakes were spotted. Thanks to the journal entries of two of the men, the date of the find was recorded. Monday, January 24th, 1848. This day, some kind of metal was found in the tail of the race that looks like gold. It was first found by James W. Marshall, the boss of the mill. The metal passed every test, including the harsh lie of Mrs. Wimmer's soap kettle. The only thing left to do was convince John Sutter. He was skeptical at first, but when he paid a visit to the mill, Marshall and the others determined to help convince him by salting the race. The plan almost backfired when the Wimmer boys found the gold before Sutter did, but he had seen enough to be convinced. It wasn't long until word of the find spread and curious comrades visited their friends in Coloma. On one such trip, Sidney Wills and Wilford Hudson found more gold particles on a sandbar in the American River. The strike became known as Mormon Island and turned out to be the second major gold strike, one with very rich diggings. Meanwhile, the merchants in San Francisco were concerned that the city wasn't growing fast enough. They suggested a special edition of the California Star, extolling the virtues of the city and the state. The paper was ready to print except for a couple of empty inches on an inside page when news of a gold discovery in Coloma reached San Francisco. Several battalion members were hired as express riders to carry copies of the Star East and the few lines about gold which they carried cross-country to St. Louis, Baltimore, New York, and other major cities of the East would trigger the gold rush of 49. Hordes of gold seekers flocked to Coloma from San Francisco and Monterey. Italian members continued to work for Sutter, but in their spare time, they too joined in the search. It was mining in a primitive way. We had no pans, no lumber to make rockers, and so we used Indian baskets to pan with. We would dump the gold in the flour sacks spread out upon the ground. At Mormon Island, Ezra and William tried their hand at panning for gold as well. But we did not stop for long. We were anxious to come to Salt Lake. After the discovery of gold, all my plans and projects came to naught. One after another, my people disappeared in the directions of the gold field. Only the Mormons remained to finish. We apologize and worship God. Led by Brigham Young, we set up temporary camps throughout southwestern Iowa while we determined where we could settle. We had a new home for us out west, but we had very little means for the thousands of saints to make a journey. Despite the difficult circumstances, we chose to be happy. I was only 17, and big for my age.
William Huntington, camp leader. Captain James Allen, U.S. Army. An official United States business. Well, how can I assist you, Captain? I need to speak to Brigham Young. Well, he's not here. I'm in charge of this camp. Would you like to sit down and maybe offer you anything? I've come under the direction of President James K. Polk to organize an army of the West in our war with Mexico. I'm here to enlist the service of five companies of 100 men each in a period of 12 months. The men must be healthy between the ages of 18 and 45. We'll march from Fort Leavenworth to California to secure and fortify the territory. Well, I'm not sure we're going to be able to help you, Captain, but uh, we will notify Brigham Young. Miss Huntington, this is an offer from the President of the United States. And it's an opportunity for you to send some of your people west at the expense of the U.S. government. I understand, Captain. Thank you. Thank you. The government didn't protect our rights. Now they want us to fight a war with Mexico. This is one man who will not be going. I wonder what Brigham Young will have to say about this. We await any instructions as to how to best deal with this new development. Your servant in the Lord, Wilfred Woodruff. Sending our men to war? I sent a message to President Polk, requesting a contract, offering to build way stations westward along the Overland Trail as a means to pay for our migration west. I assume this is his answer. How could we send 500 of our men? What about their families? We would organize to care for them. It would help financially and get many of our men roughly 800 miles from our destination. The battalion could earn several thousand dollars. We've pled with the Lord to help us find a way to move west. I believe this is his answer. So Captain Allen and Brigham Young spent the next three weeks going camp to camp to recruit the 500 men. I am here to recruit five companies to the U.S. Army of the West. The enlisted will receive pay and rations, and will be entitled to all the benefits and comforts of regular soldiers of the Army. When discharged to California, you may keep your firearms. Volunteers, come forward. Friends, I know this comes at a difficult time, but I believe the captain's request is an answer to our prayers and a way to help us pay for our trip west. But it will be difficult for the families left behind. They will be provided for. And the Lord will bless each of you for your sacrifice. The Lord's hand is in this. Ask again. Volunteers, come forward. I will go. Sacrifice isn't easy, but we knew we could trust God, and we knew He had given us a real prophet in Brigham Young. Are you going to enlist? I don't want to, son, but I feel like it's the right thing to do. Then I'll come with you. So for us, making the decision to volunteer at Brigham Young's request came down to a question of faith in Jesus Christ. It wasn't easy, but in the end, just under 500 men volunteered, and almost 80 women and children accompanied them. We enlisted. 
trusting God had a purpose in having us join the army. But that remained to be seen. Funny thing about faith, sometimes you needed to make a decision. Other times you needed after. Army, we can choose to receive uniforms or a clothing allowance, mm -hmm. which means we can wear what we've got and send the money back to help the other children. That is wonderful. Whoa, we got a storm coming in. On, our supplies were rapidly depleting. We rationed our food and water, but eventually ran out. I'm thirsty. Mm. We all are, son. We had been without water for 48 hours, and things were starting to look pretty grisly. And many of the men were becoming ill. How far is that? 25 miles, sir. The men must be prepared. We will go another mile. Yes, sir. As we pressed on towards Santa Fe, much of the battalion was ill and worn ragged. Dr. Sanderson cared for them, administering the army prescribed calomel. But it didn't seem to help. Doctors later learned that calomel was a deadly poison. 